Ralph here from Wood Academy, and in this video I'm going to show you how to make this tenoning jig. But I'm also going to show you how I've made the original and then had to modify it to take care of a few minor problems that I didn't pick up in the original design. And I think that information will be more useful to you in the long run than the tenoning jig itself. Now while I'm calling this a tenoning jig, and it certainly can be used with a blade for tenoning, I actually created it in order to cope the ends of these style and rail doors using the molding head on my table saw. This molding head is from Korob Cutters. And it's important when using the molding head to make the style and rail doors, making the rail cuts along the long edges of the parts is no big deal. But to cut the copes at the ends becomes a bit tricky the part not only has to be kept perpendicular to the table, but it's also highly important that it's clamped in place. Here I'm using the micro jig dovetail clamps in order to ensure that when it's over the opening of the table throat plate insert, it doesn't fall down in. That would be not only damaging to the part, but incredibly dangerous. This method holds everything perfectly still and secure while I'm working in total safety and my hands are never anywhere near the spinning parts. So this sled works with the zero play guide bar from Microjig, which allows me to set it into my miter slot and have no play side to side, which is deeply important. We're going to use a little bit of their hardware as well, their dovetail hardware, to allow the thing to slide side to side. And of course the dovetail clamps to hold our parts in place. You'll also notice that I'm using two clamps. One that's holding the part that I'm milling, but a second one to hold a piece of scrap that backs up the part that I'm cutting so that I get clean edges as I mill the ends of these parts. So let's get started on the build process. You'll need three pieces of good quality plywood, 6 inches by 10 inches, and another small piece to form the vertical cleat. Two grooves are cut into the sled base across the 6 inch dimension. They're a quarter inch wide, 5 16 deep, and centered 3 inches in from each end. Without changing the setup, the slide gets a single groove at 3 inches. The vertical face gets two grooves along the 10 inch length, one at an inch and a half from the edge, the other at three and a half. Next, the standard holes for mounting the zero play guide bar are drilled into the base. These are half inch counter bores with a quarter inch through hole drilled three inches in from one of the long edges. Moving to the router table, the vertical face gets a shallow groove where it attaches to the slide. The router table is set up with the dovetail bit, and both of the grooves in the vertical face get milled, and then just one of the grooves in the base gets milled. Finally, we need to rip a piece of hardwood a quarter inch thick and a half inch wide. Pilot holes are drilled in the groove on the vertical face, which is then glued and screwed to the edge of the slide. The hardwood runner is glued into the groove on the bottom of the slide. This runner locates the vertical fence assembly onto the base. Two holes are marked on the slide, centered on the dovetail groove in the base which are then drilled through the slide using a quarter inch bit. The cleat is clamped to the back of the vertical face and a square is used to ensure that it's perpendicular. The zero play guide bar is mounted to the base and then squared up using the rip fence. The track screws are slid into the dovetail groove on the base and the vertical face assembly set into place, feeding the threaded rods from the track screws through the holes in the slide. 
the vertical face slides side to side along the hardwood runner, and the track screws clamp it in place once it's positioned. Now the biggest change was in the base here. This base was originally six inches wide, which only allowed me to withdraw the face here about to the outside of my molding head. And while that allowed me to do the cut I wanted to do here on a three quarter piece, if I had a, a piece that was thicker and I wanted to make a tenon, I wouldn't have had the room to back this off far enough. So that was a mistake on my part, something I didn't see until I actually started using the tool. And so I cut one inch off of the base. So the zero play guide bar, the miter slot, is no longer in the center of the base, but I just cut this off at five inches. The measured drawings in the plans will show the new corrected dimension, but this allows me to be able to move the part much farther away to be able to give me a little more flexibility on tenoning. I also added a couple of um, corner blocks just to help keep this angle here perpendicular. It was perpendicular because of the way we put the little slot in and then screwed it together, but this will keep it accurate over time. And then I added a handle. Now you can use whatever handle you want. This is an older handle from one of my old micro jig tools. So it's a very comfortable handle. It works well. You can buy this from Microjig directly as a repair part. It'll come in yellow now, but it's a great handle to use. And so I happen to have one hanging around, but you can mount whatever handle on here you want. Just be careful when you mount your handle. I didn't give you mounting positions in the drawing because depending on your handle, it might be very different. You don't want the handle to be in the way of your knobs and the handle should be mounted off centered from where your zero play guide bar is just so that there's no interference. And of course it needs to be mounted so it doesn't interfere with the, the slots and the mechanism for the side to side movement on your jig. This jig is perfect for use with the molding head and it'll be just as useful with a standard blade cutting tenons. As always, you can find measured drawings for this jig at woodcademy.com.